morning, everybody. Um, welcome to another Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants episode. And for those of you who don't know, we are uh, our values at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants are all about bringing science, adventure, and exploration to classrooms across North America and beyond. And I'm Sarah Provado, and I'll be your host for today. So thanks for joining us. And I'm very excited to say that this month we are celebrating women in science and exploration. So we're on the tail end of the incredible month um, that was filled with lots of amazing scientists. And today we are very lucky to have Sarah Outen joining us. And Sarah is an adventurer by land and sea, a best-selling author and a motivational speaker. She's keen to encourage people into the outdoors and enable young people to have access to outdoors and adventure. In November 2015, Sarah completed her most recent major expedition, London to London via the world. It was an attempt to roll, to row, cycle, and kayak 25,000 miles across the Northern Hemisphere. The journey took four and a half years to complete and was all the richer for not going exactly as planned. Sarah had set off in 2011, but unfortunately the Pacific attempt was cut short by a tropical storm. Nonetheless, Sarah persevered and returned in 2014 to paddle 1,500 miles to Alaska. And then she cycled 500 miles, 5,000 miles across North America. And from there, she rode over 36,000 miles, th sorry, 3,600 miles of the Atlantic Ocean. And I would say that's quite a feat. So before Sarah gets started, um, we'll go around and say hi to the classrooms that were joining us. And then after Sarah gives her talk, we can go around for a question. And uh, since there's only two classrooms here today, we can uh, take some time with the questions. And just as a reminder for those who may be joining via YouTube live feed, um, there's a YouTube chat sidebar. So classrooms that are joining us there, you guys can send in your grade and location and we can try to get some of your questions in. So let us meet our first class today. We have um, Mr. Candela's class from Kingston, Canada. It's a grade seven class. So if you guys want to say hello, you got your mic is on now. Hello. Hi. Michael, you're going to have to move somewhere else. <laughs> All right. All right. So then we also have Mrs. Rose class um, from Easton, USA, and it is a grade seven class. So if you want guys want to say hello. Hi. <laughs> Awesome. So, um, Sarah, if you want to take it away, uh, give a slideshow. I know you can just click the screen share button. Cool. Okay, let me just pull up. I want to do a bit of a screen share. Come on, man. Oh, there we go. Screen share. Desktop. Start screen share. Excuse me talking to myself whilst I do this. Okay, so now hopefully you guys will be able to see my slides. Is that so? Mm -hmm. Just checking. Can you, Sarah, can you see my slides having pressed that? Um, all I can see right now is my face. <laughs> um, uh -huh. So it says you are screen sharing. Maybe you have to do a full screen. Um, with the slides yeah okay that's what i tried there if you there we go now we can see that oh so you can see that cool yeah. can you see it you can see it as full screen can you um no we're seeing it as one slide by slide so uh i don't know hmm. maybe if you click use slideshow in the corner there, there ah go. good shot here we are okay. happy days okay <laughs> uh so Mr. Candela's class and Miss Rose's class, it's good to meet you virtually by the, the wonders of the internet right now. I'm sitting on my sofa in my living room in Oxfordshire, UK, so a few thousand miles away from both of, uh, of your locations right now. Um, as Sarah mentioned in the introduction, I've spent quite a bit of time over the last Ooh, 10 years or so out on big adventures. And so what I'm going to do today is talk about, about some of those, uh, namely my London to London via the world journey, which I finished in 2015 and took me four and a half years to get back home after I set out. 
But what I want to do to start with is just go a little bit back, like back to the beginning, because people often wonder, where did that come from? They say, like, what did your parents feed you when you were younger to make that happen? And for me, it was all about spending lots of time outside. So nothing particularly crazy or technical. I spent a lot of time out with my brothers and my family, out walking the dogs, climbing trees, making dens, going camping and hiking. And when I was a little bit older, I started doing some smaller expeditions. We have uh, an award system in the UK for young teenagers to complete their own little expeditions over a couple of days, sort of three days, four days. It's kind of progressive and you do other things alongside that. And it's a really good way to get into having sort of your own adventures. And then when I was about 13 years old, I also joined my local kayaking club, a local canoe club. And I think it was about then that I really got a sense of why I loved to be outside and to be making my own journeys. I felt that I really enjoyed being the engine behind where I wanted to get to. And I loved the way that when I was outside, be it walking or climbing trees or kayaking or riding my bike, I really loved the way that I felt a part of the environment. I felt really immersed in what was going on around me. And I've always loved human powered travel because you do travel so slowly. And I think you're more aware of what's happening with the weather. Um, you really feel it. You know, if you cycle up a mountain, you have a very different experience to if you zoomed up that mountain in a Jeep for example. So I had this real sense of how much I loved making journeys. And a, and a big sense as I got a little bit older, kind of towards the end of my schooling, I had this sense that one day I wanted to make a really big journey. And so then I went off to study at university. I wanted to study biology. So off I went and I did lots of rowing. I think you call it crew over there. So racing skinny boats down rivers. Um, and it was whilst I was studying at university that I heard about the idea of ocean rowing. So this idea where you take a small boat, you pack everything into it that you might need for a, a multi-month journey across an ocean and off you go and you take everything that you need with you and you survive and, and hopefully enjoy it and then you get to the other side. And I remember feeling when I heard about this one day, I remember thinking, wow, I want to do that. That is what I'm going to do when I leave university once I've graduated. And so I asked all my friends and family, hey, who wants to come rowing? And they all said no. And so then I asked people at the university, other kind of fellow students, perhaps who I didn't know. And I started putting a team together because it had not occurred to me the idea of going solo. I thought I want to do this with a, a group of people. We'll cross an ocean together. And it was quite early on in that sort of planning process whilst I'm still studying that my father died really suddenly and unexpectedly. And so again, very quickly, I had a sense of what I wanted to do. And I decided that I still wanted to row across the ocean but I wanted to go solo now. I wanted to use the ocean as a positive way, like a really tangible way, something I could really respond to, to get through that grief. And so I decided that I wanted to row across the Indian Ocean, that I'd go from Australia across to Mauritius. And I set my goal a couple of years away because I still had to graduate and I knew that I'd have to raise lots of funds to be able to build a boat, to train, to, to work out how to use it all and all the equipment and, and get myself out to Australia. So it took three years to get that project off the ground and um, it ended up being a four month crossing from Australia over to Mauritius, which is kind of off the coast of Madagascar, off the, of the eastern coast of Africa. And whilst I was out there on that journey, so spending four months by myself, I guess two important things happened. I was inspired by what I found out there. 
of all the different color blues that I saw, the changing weather, the vastness of it, just how massive it felt and how tiny I felt, and the wildlife. I mean, think whales as long as swimming pools, um, albatrosses, you know, giant birds with wingspans almost as long as my boat. I was so inspired by the ocean that I thought I'd like to spend more time out at sea. And I was also really empowered by having made that journey a reality. I've always thought that there's not many things that are rocket science apart from rocket science. So I had this sense of kind of thinking, wow, I can do whatever it is that I want to set my mind to. I think that's a really important kind of belief to have within us, something that allows our mind and imagination to run free. And then the confidence to say, okay, here I am and I want to get to here. And even though I might not know all the steps on the way, I'm gonna go and find them out and I'm gonna be creative and determined and I'm gonna make that happen. And so my next sort of step from there, um, on the basis of being inspired by my time at sea on the Indian Ocean and empowered by having made that journey reality, I decided that I wanted to row and kayak and cycle right around the Northern Hemisphere. And I wanted my journey to start and finish in London. So I called it London to London via the world. And I set my start date as April 1st, 2011. And I took out my map and I started sketching routes all over it and thinking about how it might work and looking at the logistics. How would I get my boat across the other side of the continent? What would I need? How long would it take? And I started thinking about who I'd need as part of my team as well. I'd need people at home to be working on managing things uh, there in case I needed help from afar, you know, if I needed advice. And I also chose somebody who would come and kayak on the kayaking legs with me. And so if you just look at the map there, um, have a quick look at as to where you guys are over on the sort of left-hand side of the screen on the eastern uh, sort of sides of, of USA and, and Canada. And then find where I am in the UK. And, and the route would trace to the right, left to right, as you look across um, on that map. So from west to east around the Northern Hemisphere. So kayaking down the River Thames across the English Channel to France, and then cycling right across Europe and Asia. So I went through France, Belgium, the Netherlands, Germany, Czech Republic, Poland, Ukraine, Russia, Kazakhstan, right across China, back into Russia, and then getting towards the edge of Asia there, I cycled and I kayaked down to Japan. And then I set out across the Pacific. It took me two attempts to get across. I had been aiming for Canada, but that didn't quite go to plan. I ended up in Alaska, which then added a, a very different section of journey. I kayaked through the Aleutian Islands. And then so that blue line tracing across North America, I did that by bike and then back across the Atlantic by rowing boat. Uh, you'll see the line ends somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic. That's because I ended up being picked up by a passing ship as there was a hurricane coming my way. But really, that's, that's the route, the kind of bones of it. And uh, right now, there should be, if I can get it to play here, a little video which we made towards the end of my journey. So. It's a little bit out of kilter in terms of time, but it'll just give you a sense of, of what I was up to, how I was traveling, and, and hopefully bring it to life.
basically we're going backwards quicker than we're going north. Hallucinating. So there we go. Hopefully that's given you a sense of uh, the ways that I was traveling and some of the places that I traveled to. And I think it showed pretty well some of the highs, like really extreme highs and excitement and joy. And then also some of those times when I was just afraid or finding it really tough. And certainly I think that kind of contrast, that idea of contrast is one of the reasons why I love to journey. I love to explore, to sort of find things out and just notice how things change across the planet, um, out on the ocean versus on land, be it solo for months and months at a time out at sea, you know, I don't see anybody at all, or being in a massive city like Tokyo or Beijing or, or New York. Um, and, and that's kind of how I like to think about this journey too as as one of contrasts and I also really love wildlife um, and, and certainly my journey provided lots of close encounters with all sorts of different wildlife and I, I find it kind of really quite humbling to be out in nature and to see the scale of things. I mean, that picture on the top right hand corner of the screen there, that's me holding a vertebra. So part of a backbone of a whale. I mean, can you imagine a creature that is that big? It needs a, a backbone that huge to support it. And then, then the picture below, I'm sat on a beach in Alaska watching those two young bear cubs play fight. And then this is a really interesting one, bottom left. Those are my hands. I've got a GoPro camera on my head, so it's taking photos automatically. And I'm sending this little petrel, this little bird, back out to sea, because petrels will fly around the light on my boat at night. And then often what happens is they, they kind of crash into the light and drop into the boat, and they can't get out. They're kind of flapping around madly. So I would pick them up and pop them back out to sea. And I remember the first time I did that with this little tiny bird. I mean, it's literally small enough to sit on your hand. Uh, I remember thinking, wow, be so careful, little bird. You know, you're so tiny and fragile. But that's ironic because that little tiny bird is way better adapted to life at sea than I am. So I think there's always that really interesting balance between sort of power um, and fragility and an ability to survive. Here's a shot just showing some of the different sort of people that I met on the journey. It was really such a great uh, way to meet people and get a tiny little insight, a sort of fleeting insight into different people's lives. Um, and going back to that idea of contrast, it was really interesting to me to see those kind of contrasts between cultures, uh, within cultures even, you know, as I traveled across the country, just looking at different attitudes, different ways of living and, and so on. But I think the most important thing that I sort of took from meeting so many different people um, on my journey, perhaps being invited into their home or meeting them on the road or, or whatever, the most important thing that I took was that for all that difference, all that diversity and that sense of um, 
sort of individuality, this actual this sense of togetherness, of community, and the fact that, you know, beneath all of it, for all those differences, we are all humans. And that's probably a really obvious thing to say, but it's also something that I think is, is really easy to forget. You know, there's lots of um, there's lots of chat in the media about walls being built or people not being allowed into certain countries and uh, huge bloodshed in sort of war-torn areas or, or racism or homophobia or so on. And uh, so I think it's really important just to to remember that, that, you know, beneath everything, beneath all those differences, we are exactly the same. We are all human. So... I'm just going to check in on the time there. I think I can talk for just a little bit more and then we'll go to some questions. So what I want to do is, is share with you a story from the Pacific Ocean because I think the ocean legs of my journeys are some of the most abstract. They're some of the parts that um, you know most people I appreciate will not go and spend months alone out at sea. So here's a picture of me sitting in front of my rowing boat, Gulliver, out in Japan back in 2012. So, whoa, six years ago now. That's crazy. So I'm surrounded by all the things I'm going to take with me out to sea. So a big part of being confident that I'm ready to go out on the ocean is my mental kind of readiness so that's thinking about ways i'm going to deal with certain situations um, it's making sure i've got a plan i've i've got a list of things to do if things go wrong i've had training and so on but there's also this confidence that comes with knowing that i've thought about everything that i possibly need and that i've made sure i've kind of double checked triple checked that it's all on the boat so you think about what you use in a day. Think about all the things you've used this morning. Look around the classrooms. Think about what's there. And then kind of extrapolate that up. So think, okay, and what do I use over a week? How about a month? How about two months, three months, four months, five months, six months? And suddenly you get a lot of stuff, not least on the food front. You know, if you think about all the things you eat in a day, a week, a month, and so on. That's a lot of food. It's also a lot of packaging that goes with that. So I have to be mindful of all of those things when I'm setting out on a big journey. I've taken all the excess packaging off things. For my food, I've got food that's gonna survive five or six months at sea. That's food that's got lots of calories for energy. It's got protein, because my muscles are gonna be pretty stressed. They're going to need lots of um, protein to repair themselves. I've got a, a machine to make water, so a desalination unit. If you think about how that word's made up, desalination, that's literally taking the salt out of seawater by squeezing it at very high pressure. And then I'll have water that I can use for drinking, for washing, for cooking. And how do I cook on such a small boat? Well, I've got a little gas camping stove. I've also got uh, spares, repairs, clothing for all the different weathers that I'm going to go through. Um, I've got some birthday presents because that's good for morale. And you'll see over the boat itself. So the boat itself is seven meters. That's uh, about 21 feet long. And that lumpy bit on the right hand side of the screen, that's a cabin where I sleep. It's got solar panels, those black patches all over the the, uh, the, the roof of the cabin there, charging up my batteries so I can charge my electronics. The middle section of the boat that kind of dips down a bit, that's where I row. So there's a sliding seat, takes me backwards and forwards. And then the front of the boat, at the other end, that's more storage. So I set out to sea in the middle of May 2012, expecting that I might take about five or six months to cross 4,000 miles to get over to Vancouver, Canada, or perhaps I'd go a bit further south and reach Seattle area. Um, it didn't quite go to plan. I was merrily settling into life at sea, kind of trying to row, eat and sleep with whatever the, the weather allowed. 
Uh, that's a picture of my cabin in there on the right hand side. You see all my photos, messages that I've written all over the walls, my soft toys, my little tiny bed. Um, and as I say, it didn't quite go to plan because three weeks in, I was told by my weather guy who I was communicating with over a satellite phone, I was told that there was this big storm system coming. It was a hurricane forming down in the Philippines and it was due over my area in about a week. So I had a decision to make. Do I get picked up and go home? So that would be getting picked up by a passing um, sailing boat, a big cargo vessel, something like that. Or do I wait it out? My weather guy said the good news is that it's going to downgrade to a tropical storm by the time it reaches you in a week's time. And so after a couple of days thinking, I decided to stay. And I prepared my boat as best I could. I battened down the hatches, I tied everything down, I flooded the ballast tank. And then I thought about how am I going to get through this, physic this um, it, mentally, emotionally? Because it's quite a passive act. That means you can't really do much when you're in the throes of a giant storm. So waves that are maybe 15 meters high, winds faster than you guys drive down, well, <laughs> you guys, than your parents and your teachers would drive down um, the highways, the interstates. So kind of 60 plus miles an hour. I decided the best way to do it was to try and remain present so I could see what was going on, but also kind of zone out, almost meditate out of it. And so I strapped myself into that little tiny bed that you saw. I had a harness where I strapped in and I just lay there and tried to keep safe for three of the scariest days of my life. It was absolutely terrifying. It was violent and chaotic and incredibly noisy as the boat was capsized. So literally smashed upside down over and over again. At times it felt like we were being lifted up, smashed down onto concrete, something like that. It was halfway through that storm that I realized so much damage had happened to the boat that I wouldn't be able to repair it and carry on safely. So I called for a rescue and I was rescued by the Japan Coast Guard a day and a half later. So if you imagine what I might be thinking at that time, I was relieved, I was grateful that these guys had come out to rescue me. I was also really sad that I'd be leaving my rowing boat behind. We couldn't take the rowing boat with us. So here's a shout, if you're ever in the Pacific and you notice a little blue boat, to let me know. I came home from that row, I flew all the way back to the UK once I was back on land and I fell into another storm. So it was like a storm of depression. All that trauma and adrenaline and fear from those three days in the boat, they all kind of get stored in your body. So that all just sort of fell apart when I came back home. And it took a lot of work to get back to a place where I was happy again. I was content, I could cope. And I was really keen that I'd go back to the ocean. Uh, luckily the insurance paid out I was able to buy another boat, the sister boat to Gulliver, who happened to be for sale at that time. And we strengthened various things, modified different bits. I got fit and healthy again. And I went back the following, the following year with Happy Socks. We called the boat Happy Socks. And had an amazing time out there. I made good progress to start with. I was going in the right direction. I saw lots of wildlife. Here's a picture of a shark that I saw one day. It was at a time when I was thinking about going for a swim. You can imagine that I did not go for a swim after I saw the shark. I think people often think that I see sharks all the time out at sea and it's not so. There's so, so many threats facing sharks now. Overfishing, poor fishing practices, a uh, specific targeting for shark fin soup that the numbers are just crashing. Uh, we, we've got a, a massively threatened um, sort of shark population uh, going on at the moment. Here's one of my favorite fish, 
from the ocean. This is a sunfish. Don't know if any of you guessed that already. Uh, big goggly eyes. It's got a big kind of gaping mouth at the front and it's about two meters from end to end and, and almost the same in terms of uh, fin length to fin length. They'd always come and follow my boat and, and just see what was going on. Then there's the massive aeroplane like wings of the albatross. This fella is about two and a half meters across. They're such big birds. It takes such a lot of energy to get them airborne that once they're airborne, they've, they've got this amazing way of just soaring down the waves. They'll kind of uh, go down the waves, turn up into it, so they get that uplift, and it means they don't have to flap their wings, um, perhaps for miles and miles at a time. They're really beautiful birds. But we've got a massive problem with uh, seabirds as well at the moment, in that they're eating, same goes for sea turtles too. Uh, these guys are all eating lots and lots of plastic. So out at sea, I saw plastic almost every day, I'd say. Uh, it might be plastic bags, it might be bits of uh, food cartons, like you can see here, disposable lids, coffee cups, disposable cutlery, bits of clothing. Now what happens is that stuff gets broken down into smaller and smaller pieces. Those pieces end up looking like fish eggs or like little fish. And so the seabirds, the sea turtles, the fish, they don't know the difference. So they'll go eating all these things, thinking that it's food. And so, of course, that basically uh, starves them from the inside out. And the other problem is as that uh, plastic enters the food chain, it contaminates everything up the food chain. So the chances are that every bit of seafood we eat now has some degree of, of plastic pollution inside it. And so I think that's one of the most important things that my journey has showed me, is that sort of reminder um, of our far-reaching influence as humanity, and that that's not always a positive influence on the planet either. So on the one hand, the ocean teaches me that we need to consume more consciously uh, we can't just waste resources left, right and centre, you know. We've got to think about reducing our energy use, um, reducing our plastics use and making sure that if we do have to use those plastics that they can be recycled or disposed of in a way that they're not going to be entering uh, the environment and sort of contaminating that, that whole system. So that's definitely a shout out from me and a shout out from all those ocean creatures that I saw uh, to try and reduce our own plastics imprint, you know. Uh, we may only be one person or one class or, or one school, but I think together by uh, sharing ideas and, and educating people uh, that we can actually make a positive difference. And I think for you guys as the future scientists, engineers, storytellers, broadcasters, uh, manufacturers of tomorrow, um, there's, there's such a sort of an opportunity there for creating whole new materials, whole new ways of thinking and, and getting our behavior to change so that we're improving our relationship with uh, these other creatures and, and environments that we share on, on planet Earth. That's an awesome message, Sarah. Um, sorry to interrupt you there, but I think that was a great oh, to transition over to some questions just so we can squeeze some of those out. We did start a little bit late. Uh -huh. Um, so if Mr. Um, Kendall's class wants to come to the front and ask their question, their mic is unmuted and Sarah can uh, ask those questions for you. No, you have to go on. <coughs> Just sit down. Yeah. Hey girls. Hi. Um, what was the hardest obstacle that you other than the hurricane that you went through? The hardest obstacle that I went through, I think it was probably that kind of aftermath, that fallout when I came home. Uh, it very quickly felt like I couldn't really cope and I had to deal with what had happened to, um, to be able to get back to a place where I could think about carrying on. And then it was that sense of having to um, 
get the whole project back up and going away again. So keeping that momentum and focus. I think it's, it can be easy sometimes when things don't go right to lose motivation, to lose belief and so on. But I think if you can remind yourself of the reasons why you're doing it and um, your sort of belief in whatever it is that you are doing, then it's amazing the, the drive and the energy that that can give you. Um, uh, the second question is, did yeah. the I ideology of a girl shouldn't or a girl can't ever stop you from achieving your dreams and going on this mission? Yeah, it's a really good question. So did the I idea of um, a girl shouldn't or can't go on a journey like this ever stop me? I never faced that explicitly, certainly in the planning stages um, and, and before leaving. Once I was away, I sometimes had lots of questions from people, particularly through certain Asian countries where I think culturally it was quite surprising to see a woman out cycling alone. I had those sorts of questions, but never in a way that said, you shouldn't do this. Um, it was more in like a surprise of, whoa, what, what are you doing? Where's your husband? Where's your kids? Um, and then there was real support as well. I think, interestingly, um, the messages are much more implicit. So they're much more subtle. But when you look for them, they're quite blatant. I think we're still facing a huge gender imbalance in terms of the sponsorship that's available, the role models that are given visibility in the mainstream media. And um, in certain attitudes, I, I think actually thinking about it, there was one time that I heard somebody say, it was someone that had come along to a talk that I was giving. And afterwards I was answering some questions individually with people. And somebody said, oh, wow, that's, that's amazing. And for a woman too. And it took me by such a surprise that I didn't know what to say. And he'd kind of walked on as well, but um, that, was, that was really it. And I, I think my message to you, um, both guys and girls in the room, is that sense of don't ever let anyone tell you what you can or you can't do. I mean, if it's something for your own safety, like if you put your fingers into that flame, it's gonna burn, you should listen. But just generally, don't ever let anyone tell you that your dream isn't valid or you can't do that because they want you to do this, you know? Be true to who you are and support each other in that as well. Okay, thank you. Awesome question, guys. I think that um, was a message that a lot of people needed to hear. So um, you guys can uh, come up and ask another question if you have some time. Um, we start a little bit late, so I can go for another four minutes if anyone else wants to ask Sarah another question. Um, did you have any did you have any other conflicts besides weather wise? Aha, uh -huh. did I have any other issues besides weather and so on? Um, did you say issues or contacts? Like um yeah, just issues. Issues. Good one. Okay. Yeah. Plenty of issues. Um, the kayaking. So I told you about um, the fact that I didn't make it to Canada the first time when I was rowing on the Pacific. I was rescued. I came home and then I started out again, but I still didn't make it to Canada. The weather was so challenging that I had to divert north and excuse me, go to the Aleutian Islands in Alaska. And that meant that I then had to go home, recover, train, go back to the Aleutians to then be able to kayak for 1500 miles to get to the nearest road where I could cycle. So that ended up being a three and a half month journey. And it was so challenging. I felt scared about 80% of the time. And that's quite a big deal, dealing with fear all the time. I was worried I was going to fall in. I was worried I wasn't good enough. I was worried I was going to get eaten by bears. And my paddling partner, Justine, and I were so remote. We were so far away from other people in really difficult circumstances that I really felt that pressure. And so dealing with that pressure and fear day after day after day and physically having to paddle for sometimes 18 hours without getting out of our boats. That was really, really tough. 
And I think the way that we dealt with that was to try and rationalize the fear. So say to ourselves, okay, this is scary, but we're making good decisions. We've got the right training. We've got each other. And certainly one thing for me was to try and break it up into small chunks. So instead of thinking, ah, I've got a thousand miles left to go, I would try and think, okay, today we've got 25 miles to do. That's my goal for today. So try not to think about the scary stuff, but focus in on, okay, what do I need to do right now? So that's a technique I use all the time, even now. Thank you. That was an excellent point. I think it's uh, definitely important to implement the short-term and long-term goal thing to keep things in perspective and stop the uh, the panic of of larger of larger pictures to set in. So, um, an awesome an awesome piece of advice from somebody who implemented it in the largest way. Um, does anybody else have any more questions? We can take one more and then uh, we can sign off for the day. Awesome. Class is yeah. oh. <laughs> yeah. Your class now. We have um, Mrs. Rose's class had to leave, um, but she's still sticking around. But I don't think she has any questions. So if uh, you, Mr. Candela, anyone else wants to come up and ask a question, you guys have the floor. I have a quick question, and then we have to go as well. I'm trying to figure out if it would be more challenging land or by ocean. Um, when you say a thousand miles, I don't know what's harder, a thousand miles in the water or a thousand miles on land? What is it, what's harder for you? That's a good question, land or sea? I think that certainly in the context of my journey, when I was on land, I was cycling on roads or tracks and there were always people. I think maybe there's the difference is that if something went wrong, there were people roughly nearby. You know, it might take a couple of days to get help, but roughly nearby. Whereas out at sea, it is remote. You can't get a break from it. You know, you're exposed and, and, and vulnerable out there, really. But I suppose the same could be said if you were in certain environments on, on land, you know. A thousand miles in Antarctica would feel quite different to a thousand miles across the number one highway in Canada, for example. So um, certainly in my experience, sea was more challenging than land, but I think probably the question depends a little bit on which kind of environment you're, you're, you're traveling in by land and maybe how you're traveling by sea as well, because perhaps some of those issues that I faced would have felt quite different if I was with other people or maybe in a different type of boat as well. Awesome question. Thank um, you. Thanks, Mr. Candela, and your class. Yeah, um, awesome question to put every, everything in perspective there. Um, so thanks, I guess, Mr. Candela's class and uh, Mrs. Rose's class earlier for joining us um, for an awesome talk. Um, and thanks, Sarah, for all she does and for truly being an inspiration uh, for the next generation of adventurers and to, to show what it really happens if you put your mind to something. So uh, thank you. And for our classrooms and anyone else watching, you can go to explorebythecityofpants.com uh, to check out future events that we have coming up. So thanks everybody for participating and we'll be signing off for today. So joining us next time. Bye guys. Great. Thanks for hosting, Sarah. And thank you, uh, Mr. Sarah. and Mr. Candela's classes for joining us. That was cool. Thank you. I hope you can join in with some of the other Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants uh, forums as well. Oh my gosh, Sarah, what an awesome talk. <laughs> oh, no worries. Oh, so cool though. I was like kind of fangirling in my own seat, just hearing about like the girls' questions and it's just, I don't know, so awesome. So I really appreciate you coming out and giving the opportunity to tell your story, which you're really good at telling your story, I gotta say. Thank you, thank you. It's quite curious doing it um, one way only. So during during the, um, you know, me talking, I, I can't hear, I can't see anything. That feels quite weird, because I, I sent you an email partway through just going, what well, partway through the video saying, is this working at your end? Because I oh. thought if it drops off, I wouldn't know. And uh, yeah, but uh, I really enjoy 
I really enjoy being able to share it and particularly sort of asking the questions and just wondering what it might spark in in those youngsters so thanks for helping be a part of that oh my i'm just i'm just a pawn in this trade but i think it's uh that's definitely one of the reasons that i love it is that you never know like what you're going to say is going to stick with somebody for years and you know nurture yeah. them. Yeah. so definitely, definitely. but um so thanks for joining us and i don't want to take up any more of your day um but uh yeah you know thanks for doing what you do oh. Well, likewise, likewise. And I wish you well on your journey as you study and beyond. And I hope you get to Alaska. It's beautiful. Yeah, I'll have to now. Uh, yeah. I've said it, so it must be. <laughs> yeah, good one. Good to chat, Sarah. Good to meet you. Absolutely. Cheers, Sarah. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.